If you're visiting today, my name's Kyle. I serve as lead pastor here. I want to welcome you uh, to New Life Community Church. We're glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. Um, we do believe that it is only on Christ the solid rock we will stand, that all of the ground is sinking sand, and Christ has told us uh, what the rock is particularly that we must stand on, and it is His Word. Amen? So in that spirit, we open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We are uh, striving more than anything here to be a people of the Word. We want to be a people of the Word, transformed by the Word, living by the Word, uh, obeying the Word, uh, faith in the Word. And so uh, we're going to see a lot of that. We've been walking through 1 John, and now we enter uh, the last chapter of 1 John. And in this series, we've been exploring this idea of the fullness of joy in devotion to Christ. The fullness of joy in devotion to Christ. And we've just been looking along the way at what it means to have, uh, what it means to be devoted to Christ. Uh, You might word that as a belief in Christ. And then you would have to define what does it mean to believe in Christ. I have tried to show you, and I think John more specifically has tried to show us, Uh, what he means by belief in Christ or devotion to Christ, and that is abiding in him. It's to remain in him. It's to understand that we have been loved, and so therefore we love God, and we remain in that love. What we're going to see today is that there is an overcoming nature to abiding in God. And we abide in his love by loving him. We abide in his love by obeying him. We abide in his love by loving others. And so we receive victory. We overcome the world in faith. It's through our faith that we have overcome. In fact, John the Revelator, which is the same John here, the Apostle John, John the one who wrote Revelation, He says there that we have overcome the enemy, we have overcome the evil one, we have overcome Satan by two things, the blood of the Lamb, meaning that Christ has overcome in his death, he has victory, and we have overcome by the word of our testimony, the word of our testimony, which is faith, that we have believed, and so therefore we have overcome. These these things are how we overcome. You're going to see a lot of that in our passage today. Again, we're stepping into the final chapter of 1 John this morning, uh, including today's sermon. There are four sermons left, so there's still a lot to cover over the next four weeks. And John here, as you do, you know, in anything that you write, he's kind of summing up some of the things that he has said for us. And so he restates the three tests of genuine faith that he's laid out. All right, those tests were obedience to God is one test, that those who love God will obey God. There's the test of love, that again, those who love God will love others. And then there's the test of faith, and that is that there is genuine belief. How do we know that we believe? Well, we must confess the right things. And namely, what he points us to is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And so as we'll see today, it matters what we believe. It's not just that there's belief in something, but it matters what we believe. And so John is laboring here in these final verses, but in these first five verses of of 1 John uh, chapter 5, he's laboring to show us the essential unity of these three things, that uh, these are three essential characteristics of genuine believers, that they obey, that they love, and that they have faith. These are three essential things. These three are not randomly chosen. John has not collected some hobby horses and set them up as a show and tell for us and said, hey, look at these beautiful creations I have. No. These aren't model cars that he's created and said, hey, will you look at this? No, not at all. These are essential tests of the faith. They're essential tests of, is my love genuine? Is my belief in God genuine? And so they are woven together, intricately woven together into a single fabric 
that it's too difficult to untangle the threads. You can't pull them apart. And so faith is connected to love. Love is connected to obedience. Obedience is connected to faith. They're all interwoven, all right? So as we get ready to read this word, would you stand to your feet in the honor of the reading of God's word, if you're able? When I'm finished reading, I'll say this is the word of the Lord. I invite you to respond, thanks be to God. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. And by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for these testimonies of John that we have, that we've been coming to each Sunday morning for the last um, 16 or so weeks. And Lord, we ask today, yet again, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to believe. Uh, Lord, would you change us from the inside out by the power of your word, by the work of your spirit in us? Would you write your word upon our hearts? Would you help us to live by it? Lord, we do want to be, we confess that we are unable, but that we do want to be the kind of men and women and boys and girls who who believe that Jesus is the Christ, who love God and love others, and who strive in every way to obey you. This is the kind of people we hope to be, and we plead with your Spirit to make us these people. It's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So it's worth just kind of as a way of catching up to where we've been and some of the things that he wrote last, that we looked at last week, that he wrote in the middle there of chapter four, towards the end of chapter four, that the real link between these tests of faith and love and obedience, the real link between them is the new birth. It's the new birth, that that we must be born again. And what John is showing us in this paragraph is that we cannot believe in Jesus Christ without loving the Father and His children. And we cannot love the Father without obeying His commands and overcoming the world. And we cannot overcome the world without belief in Jesus Christ. These are the things we see here. You see, yet again, faith, love, and obedience. And so, uh, if I could put all of that into one sentence, which I've tried to do, it's this, that Christians shall overcome the world by belief in Jesus, obedience to God, and love for others. Christians shall overcome the world by belief in Jesus, obedience to God, and love for others. I'll give you a second to write that if you want. In 1 John 1 through 3, 5, sorry, chapter 5, 1 through 3, I think what we have is the interconnected nature of faith, obedience, and love. We, we see them all interwoven here. In verse 1, we read, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. So John continues to insist for us that those who love God must love other Christians as well. These two things go together. You, if you are one who says, I love God and yet hates his brother, John has told us previously, then you are a liar. And so you must love God and love your brother. Now, here in verse 1, he does this for us by identifying for us those who have been born of God. He says that everyone who believes that Jesus 
is the Christ. You need to notice what he's saying there. I'm going to try to help us understand it more fully. But notice that he's saying that not everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, that, that would be a true statement, but he, he wants to define these things for us. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And so I think in his defining this, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, he is further defining who the opponents are. They're the ones who deny the Messiahship of the Lord Jesus. They're the ones, those are the ones who earlier in the book we read have gone out from us because they were never of us. How do we know they were never of us? Because they deny the Christship. They deny the Messiahship of the Lord Jesus. They don't think he's the Savior. They don't think he's the Messiah. And so what John is saying here is that everyone who trusts that Jesus is the Messiah, that is, that he is the, the promised one. The, the word Messiah is a hearkening back to Old Testament promises. That God would send the Messiah. That he would send the one who would save his people from their sins. And so what John is saying is everyone who believes that Jesus the one who was, who, who was incarnated, the Word became flesh, John writes in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. He dwelt with God beforehand, but He became like us. He put on flesh like us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, he writes. So He is the, the promised Savior sent in the person of Jesus. And so Jesus is the Christ, and everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, he says, has been born of God, meaning he's given the right to become sons and daughters. Again, there in John chapter 1, as he's writing about the incarnation of Jesus, he says that he came to his own, he came to the Jews, but the Jews did not receive him. And then he says, but to everyone who did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. And so he makes them children. This is what John is restating here. Everyone who believes has been born of God. He is his child. He's a child of God. This is what we read last week in four, verses 14 and 15 of chapter 4. We have seen, John writes, and we testify, he's talking about the apostles, what they've seen, what they testify, that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God God abides in him and he in God. So last week we have John saying that Jesus is the Son of God. It's a declaration of his deity. And here, and further, what you're going to see next week is this begins the declaration of his humanity, that Jesus, the person Jesus, the one whom we saw and we talked to and we heard and we touched him, and we, we've known him, we've seen him eat, we dwelt with him. Right? We, we lived beside him. We walked with him. The one whom we've seen, Jesus, he is the Christ. He's the Messiah. And John is telling us that there is no such thing as new birth apart from belief that Jesus is the Christ, that the Son of God put on flesh in Jesus and he became the Messiah. He is the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. Now, what that means is he's the Savior for the world. He, he's the one who's atoned for sin. He's the one by whom, if we will believe, we can be saved. And so Jesus, in John chapter 14, says something of this about himself. He says that I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Now, again, this flies in the face of all that the Jews had previously believed, at least in that sense. I'm the one by whom you come to the Father. In Acts 4.12, we read that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is in a sermon to a collection of Jews in the synagogue. In Hebrews 7, we read this, consequently, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost all of those who draw near to God through him. So he saves those who draw near to God through him. So then, just as Alan read earlier, and he didn't know I had this in my notes, but 
This is what the Lord does for us. So then, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And this confidence is ours, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on him. And those who call on him, those who call on him in faith, who call on him for salvation from sins in faith, are brought into his family as adopted sons and daughters of God the Father. You're joined to the church of Jesus Christ. And this church transcends space and time. That was one of the beautiful things about what we looked at earlier with our missionaries, with the missionaries of, of DTN, I should say. They're not, we, we didn't send them from here, but they're sent through DTN. We love them, we pray for them, and we support the efforts of DTN. So in a sense, they're ours, right? <laughs> we love them. But what we're seeing in that is that believers are gathered across time, across space. They had their church service earlier today because that's the difference in time, right? But they're gathered across space. But it's not just in the present, right? Past believers from every generation or from generation to generation, we might say, from the beginning of all things until the end of all things are gathered as one people of God. There are believers gathered from every tribe, tongue, and nation, but they are made one body, and that is the body of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so you, you belong to a local church. If you're a member here or you're visiting with us as a member from somewhere else today, you belong to a local church, or the local gathering of the global family, right? Just a local gathering. We recognize as we sit in here, right, New Life, that we are not the only believers in all the world. Praise God, we're not. There are many such congregations today, gathered together for the glory of the Lord and for the good of the people, to stir one another up to love and good works. They haven't forsook the gathering because they're interested in helping one another love the Lord and love others and to do good. And so the local gathering is just a smaller gathering of a global gathering. But in the local gathering, you learn to love one another. You learn to love one another through a covenant love with God and a covenant love with each other, which is why we have church membership. Anyone who loves God is called by God to love those whom God has loved. Is called by God to love those whom God has made children of himself. And if we love God, we will love his children. We'll love our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Now, faith is central to Christian living. John's going to make that clear later on in this passage. But this does not mean that all who simply profess a faith have been converted in the heart. It's one of the things John has made abundantly clear as we walk through this book. It's not just a profession of faith. He's saying there's tests of faith. There's ways to know if faith is genuine or not. And true faith is a conversion of heart. True faith is a transformation of mind. It's, it's to be set free from the bondage of sin to become a slave to Christ. Saving faith must be, therefore, transforming faith. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It must transform. And the transformation will be observable. It will be distinguished. It will be seen in our love for God, which results in an obedience to him, as we'll see, and in our love for others, which results in a unity with believers. We're drawn together. We're bound together, I should say, by the Spirit and the bond of peace, Paul writes. And so, therefore, we strive with one faith and one mind for the sake of the gospel. We work together. In verse 2, he begins to kind of fill this out. By this, we know we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. So how do we know that we love God's children? How do we know that we love those around us? Well, it's in loving God, or I should say, uh, yeah, when we love God and obey his commandments. So he, he wrote earlier for us in, in this book that believers, uh, that a love for believers proves 
one's love for God. That was one of the tests, right? Again, if any of you says that you love God and hate your brother, you are a liar. So your love for your brother proves a love for God. But now John states that a love for God proves one's love for believers. And, and what we see is, is John hasn't created some sort of um, you know, logical infallacy for us. What he's done is he's shown that this divine love which we receive must flow both ways. It must flow out of us in a love for God. It must return to God in a love for him that desires to obey him. And it must flow out of us toward others in a love for others. Divine love received then produces love for God and love for his people. Amen? No one agrees. Okay. We should start over. This love for others is not merely human love. All right, you, you have within you the ability to emotionally attach yourself to someone, to, to act in uh, love towards someone, to do good. All right, we see this in worldly people all the time. Now, we could argue about the motivations of doing good, but I'm not saying there aren't genuine feelings of love felt or known or experienced in, un, in, in the unconverted and non-Christians. But what we don't want to think is that this love for others is some merely human thing that we just have to work up in us. We're going to really struggle to love others if we think that we have to work this up in ourselves. You know, there, there is a, in Hebrews 10, again, 25, it says not to neglect the gathering together, not to neglect the meeting together as some are prone to do, but to meet together so that you may stir one another up to love and good works. So there's something, I think, in that. It's not just that showing up together makes you want to love one another. It's that showing up together for a certain purpose, which is to pursue a deeper fellowship with God, a deeper love for God, works up in you, stirs up in you, a love for one another, a love for good works. You, you see what I'm saying? Because what happens is, as we worship God, we encounter a divine love. God invites us into something spiritually that transcends anything that's happening physically at the moment. It's a hard concept, I guess, but in that same book of Hebrews, uh, Paul, uh, sorry, <laughs> not Paul, we don't know the author, uh, but the author is saying, that in worship, when God invites us into worship, we don't come to Mount Sinai. We, we don't come to something that may be touched with hands or to be felt or seen. We come to Mount Zion, a holy mountain. We're gathered together with angels and saints who have gone on before us. We're caught up spiritually in heaven with Christ as we worship. And so how then can worship True worship of God, right worship of God, where our love is fixed in the right direction and we're looking into the Word of God and we're receiving, you know, we're receiving our marching orders from God's Word and so we're stepping in faith into those things. How then can we not be stirred up by the Spirit of God to love one another and to do good works? The love of God is acting on us and as it acts on us, we love God in return and we love those around us. I hope that's clear. This is a divine love, and, and we need to understand this. But the Apostle John is not saying, hey, stir up in you this ability to love each other. He's saying, no, receive the love of God for you, and as you receive that love, as it transforms you, you will then love others. He's saying this is a test of the faith. This is showing you that genuine faith exists in you, is that you love others. So we love others properly, we might say, when we have been transformed by the love of God, which we receive in the face and in the life and in the death and in the resurrection of Christ Jesus by the power of the Spirit. Amen? 
a love that places any human, a love that places any human, any, any human relationship rather than God as the primary in our affections is not obedient love. We cannot exert human love. We cannot exalt human love over a love for God. It'll be misplaced love, and it will be imperfect love. It'll be improper love. It will be unbiblical love for them. The only way to love people rightly is to love God rightly and let it flow from that. This is the key to all great Christian relationships, whether in the church as brothers and sisters or in your homes within Christian marriage or in your homes within a loving father and a loving mother toward their children or within children toward their parents. This is how Christian relationships must work. Christians must be pursuing a love for God that transforms them to love others. And so we rightly love others. We rightly love others when we supremely love God and when we treasure Him above all human relationships. And so true love is also seen in Christians in obedience to God's commands. Now, one of those commands is to love fellow believers as we have been loved by Jesus. Jesus says there's no new command I give you than this, that you love one another as I have loved you. We see that in John chapter 13. And so we must love believers under God's love. And we must do it for his name's sake, not our own. It's for his glory, not our own. And we must also love believers because it's part of our growth and holiness. It's part of obedience to love others. This is one of the truly amazing things about human relationships under the context of God's love. So whether marriage or parenting or uh, Christian relationships within the church, you will find that there is possibly no greater sanctifying force in your life than relationships with others. The Spirit of God is going to use relationships with others in marriage, in parenting, in friendships, in the brotherhood among the saints to sanctify you, to help you grow in holiness, to help you grow in your affections for the Lord, your affections for His people. He's going to grow you in these things. He's going to help you to be obedient because when someone's personality grates against your personality, guess what happens? Friction, right? And we find that there is selfishness potentially at work in us. There are things at work in us that are contrary to the love we have received from God. And so therefore we are allowing our humanness to get in the way of divine love which we've received. They haven't sinned against us. They're just different than we are and we find them difficult to love. Right? And then it gets really difficult when they have sinned against you. Because when a Christian sins against a Christian, we're given specific instructions on how we're to handle that in Matthew chapter 18. We're told that if a brother offends you, if a brother, that is, sins against you, you are to go to him and to express the offense and to seek reconciliation with your brother. Now that really flies in the face of the individualism that exists in many churches and maybe even on our own hearts here, that if someone here were to offend us, rather than saying, let me go in love to them and to be reconciled to my brother or to my sister, we would rather say, I'll take my ball and go play in another court. And that's sinful. That goes against what God has commanded. And so we must be careful not to do that. And so what I'm trying to say is that Christian families work things out. They work things out. They deal with it because we understand that I am a sinner saved by grace, dwelling among sinners saved by grace, and so there are times where our flesh will be fleshly and we'll act in the flesh to each other. But what transcends the flesh if not the Spirit of God alive in us that draws us in love toward one another? Amen? That's our great hope. So we must love believers under God's love. We do this for His glory. This kind of love 
that I'm talking about among Christians really does take an axe to the, we'll call it the holy tree of the world's love. All right, so pretend with me for a moment that, and really they have, that the world has erected a monument, we'll say it's a tree, in which that tree is love and love is God. Love is God. And so this tree is a prized possession for them. It is the altar at which they worship. It states for them that love is God, and so they worship at its trunk, and they adore its fruit. They find it lovely. And as with all worship, right, worship in its very essence of the meaning of the word demands allegiance. It demands praise. It demands uh, submission. This is what it means to worship something. And so as with all worship, it requires obedience. And so the world says that if you are to be obedient to our God of love or to our goddess of love or to our gender-neutral God of love, then you must affirm whatever people do in the name of love. And yet John shows us clearly that true love, Christian love, is under the authority and the power of God. He states its terms. He he gives it its definitions to say that we love under God. We love under His authority. We love under what He says. We mean that He has defined love. He is love, and so He defines love. And so love can't be getting to do whatever you want in the name of love because that would go against God. That would mean rebelling against God. So that can't be what love is. Love must be, rather, a submission to God in love because he has loved us and he's given us his son to save us from our sins. And those sins include misplaced loves that we hold so dear. He has saved us. Amen? We once were adulterers and fornicators and homosexual and existing in all sorts of sexual perversions. We once were liars and deceivers. We once were slanderers. We once were deceived and deceiving others. You see what I'm saying? We once were these things, and all of those things involve pursuing the things that your heart so loves. And if it loves it that strongly, it must be true. But what the Word of God has shown us is that it's not true. They're deceptions. Satan has come to us as an angel of light, and we have taken the bait, hook, line, and sinker. And so then we are dead, or we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but by the grace and mercy of God, we have been made alive in Christ Jesus. We have been saved by His grace because of His great love toward us. And so we love others in this way. We love in a way that we want to see others set free. Amen? To not go on as we went on, but to have the testimony of, I once was, but now, but now I am free in Christ Jesus. Because those whom the Son sets free, they are free indeed, brothers and sisters. They are free. And so he loved us enough to save us from our sins. He loved us enough to save us from those misplaced loves that we hold so dear so that we might rightly love him. And to love him rightly is to have fellowship with God. It's to have fellowship with the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of all the things that are around us. It's to have fellowship with the one who breathes life into us. We want fellowship with him. We want to have fellowship with God. And so we must submit to him in faith and love him in obedience which leads us in love toward one another. And moving on here in verse 3, he says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Having mentioned love for God and obedience to his commands as elements of loving others, if that's what it means to love others, John now makes clear that these two elements are actually one element. He is saying here that to love God is to obey God. 
John is not denying that affection is part of love, but here he continues to advocate for the active side of love, that there is a work involved. Proper love for God will lead you in obedience to God. It's not just in saying, I love God, or that God is, you know, the true God, or that Jesus is God's Son. It's not just saying those things, but it's being led in action for Him. A love that obeys. Proper love for God will lead to obedience. And so where there is no obedience, there is no love for God. Despite whatever you may feel, or despite whatever claims someone may make to the contrary, it does not matter. John is saying here that if you love God, there will be obedience present. We will obey his commands. Now, John is not saying something he didn't also hear, because Jesus, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then a few verses later, in 23 and 24, he says, or John writes there, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not love my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And so John adds here that the commands of God are not burdensome for us. He wants you to know this, right? He, he, he says, and these commands or his commandments are not burdensome. Now, what he doesn't mean is that they're easy. And if you followed Jesus for more than five minutes, you know that the commandments of God are not easy. They're not easy to do. He doesn't mean that obedience is easy, for doing the right thing is rarely doing the easy thing, right? If the easy thing were the right thing, then more people would do the right thing, not less. But it's not. Often the right thing is the difficult thing. It's difficult to act in integrity. It's difficult to do the right thing, especially when no one's looking, right? It's difficult to love others who, you know, can be difficult to love. It's difficult to love God and to obey his commandments when my heart and my flesh so desire to love Kyle and obey Kyle's commandments or Kyle's desires. These things are difficult. They, they go against us, and yet... The Bible explicitly teaches us, both in commands, but also in examples, that obedience is difficult, and it often brings suffering to the believer's life. And so John would never mean that obeying Christ is easy. So what does he mean by not burdensome? comes the question. Well, I think that what he means, he goes on to, to, de to define here for us in the latter verses, but let's kind of set it up this way. He means rather that we receive a divine power for obedience. And when God has acted on us in love, again, there's a divine power now to love God. There's a divine power now to love others. God lovingly empowers us by His Spirit, He has come and made His home with us, as Christ said. He's done so by His Spirit, and He is therefore empowering us to lovingly obey Him. Lovingly acting on us, we now lovingly act toward the Father. And so obedience is not a weight that weighs us down. It's not, it's not like Christian's, you know, sack his burdensome sack that he's carrying in the Pilgrim's Progress. In fact, Christian doesn't come to understand love and to know what it means to love God and to love neighbor or to love his, his fellow believers until after the burden is removed. So it's once you become a believer that you begin to learn these things. And so we, we know that Christ is not taking a sack of weight from us and then, then heaping on another weight. In fact, he tells us in Matthew 11 that all, all of you should come to me, for my burden is light. So, obedience is not a weight that weighs us down. Rather, obedience provides 
the wings that give us flight. They're the thing, obedience is the thing by which we take flight with the Lord. It frees us to fly with Him. John 6, 33, Jesus says there, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. And so we see here a divine empowerment. It's the Spirit that gives life. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life, Jesus says. I think David understood some, something of this when he penned Psalm 119. I'm going to read you just a few of the verses here in 9 through 16. David says this, he says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments, David writes. He continues, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Do you see what the love of God transforming a person's life causes him to do? It causes him to love the laws of God. And we don't find the law burdensome, rather we find it the conduit by which we love God. We find it the way by which we show that we love God. We say, we want to obey you. We're not afraid of your commandments. We love your commandments. We store them up in our hearts so that we will not sin against you. We understand that we'll keep our way pure before you. We'll remain holy before you. This is for your glory. How dare I stain the name of the Father or the Son or the Spirit in the way that I live? And so I want to keep my way pure. But how, Lord, can I keep my way pure? By guarding it according to your word. You see, he uses word and statutes, commandments, precepts, and all of these things are describing the things in which God has spoken to us and said, this is the way of life. This is how you live. And so the words are life for the believer. The commandments are life for us. They're not death to us anymore. We've been set free from the bondage of sin and death. We've been given life. And so now in our mind and in our heart, Paul writes in Romans 6, that we are free to offer ourselves and the members of our bodies as um, instruments for righteousness sake, no longer instruments for unrighteousness sake. We live for him and we enjoy doing this. We commit ourselves to his word so that we lovingly obey him and receive the life that he lovingly grants to us. And brothers and sisters, what John is showing us is really what he's written at the very first of the book. He says so he writes these things so that our joy may be complete. You see, there's fullness of joy in a heart that's been redeemed by Christ and set free to live in obedience to the Lord. There's fullness of joy in this. In fact, you pursue your own joy in your love for God and desire to obey his word. That's where you find joy. And it is not wrong for you to pursue joy in this way. In fact, that's the only way it's right for you to pursue joy. Every other thing is the device of your own heart and will not lead to a fullness of joy, rather a fleeting measure of joy. And so Christians overcome the world by belief in Jesus. They overcome the world by obedience to God. They overcome the world by love for others. But to be sure, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. That's where John takes us next. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Look at verses 4 through 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 
So who is it that overcomes the world, he says, except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So God's commands cut across all of our fallen desires, and yet they are not burdensome because personal faith in Christ enables us to to break free from the bondage of sin. And so those whom the Son sets free are free indeed, as we've said. And so our faith, he says, this is the victory that has overcome the world, Our faith. Our faith is the faith of those who have been born of God. And it is that faith that provides the victory over this world. It is that faith which fights against the things of the enemy, right? Which desires to live by the things of God. The world is in opposition to God. It can do no other. And Christians are in opposition to the world where we can do no other. Our mind and our hearts are held captive to the word of God. We're held captive by him, by his spirit. And so the victory of the believer is a love for God through faith, which joyfully embraces the commands that God gives us. And so the world will look at believers and say, "Huh, faith didn't get them much there. Faith sure caused them a lot of hardship in that instance. Faith sure does lead to a rocky road for the believer. Faith sure does mean they have to say no to themselves a lot, and which is saying no in their eyes to happiness. What good is faith, right? By the world's standards, faith never succeeds anything. It, it, it's never successful. In their eyes... It's a fool's errand. And so they say to us, you are foolish. You're irrational. How can you believe in a God that you cannot see? Right? We've heard these things. I hope you've heard these things. It means that your faith is evident. And so we we don't succeed in the world's eyes. And yet... We overcome the enemy. And yet we overcome the enemy. We overcome his deceits. We overcome his temptations. And it is those same deceits and temptations by which the world has been led astray. And yet we overcome through trusting that God's commands are good and that they're right. And therefore we joyfully obey them because we're pursuing our joy in him despite what our fallen flesh or the temptations of this fallen world might want us to be doing. You see what I'm saying? There is victory. The victory is you overcome the enemy. The victory is you overcome his temptations, his deceits, his desires for you. You live in this world as one who is destined for another world. We sang earlier that we long for a city in which hands have not made. Amen? We do. And we do it with good company, for Abraham did the same thing. Journeyed as a sojourner, longing for a city that hands had not made. A city whose foundations were made of the Lord himself. And God says to people who are like Abraham in that sense, that he is pleased to be their God. That's what Hebrews 11 tells us. He's pleased to be their God. So it's okay to live in the world longing for a city that doesn't look anything like the world. In fact, you're obeying God in doing so. He's pleased with you. He's pleased to be your God. And so we joyfully exclaim, again, Psalm 119, my gracious, this is only 130 verses later. David had a lot to write about the word, the precepts, the commandments of God. And in Psalm 119, 137, I think this is what we joyfully exclaim along with David as Christians. He says, righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. And yet, the world would say, unrighteous, unjust are you, O Lord, and wrong are your rules, false are your rules. And yet, brothers and sisters, you need to pray to the Lord to give you a spine of steel, 
a heart of compassion, a willingness to stand when others will sit in the way of scoffers. You will stand and you will say, my Lord will not be mocked. Righteous is he. His rules are right. Amen. So to achieve this kind of victory over the world, you must trust God. You must trust God. But here's the thing, brothers and sisters, I've told you it will not be easy. John wants you to know it's not burdensome, but he's not saying it's easy. Because when you're called to trust God, you're going to have to trust God even when it hurts. So maybe you hear a sermon like today where you're called to love fellow believers. You're called to love one another. And you say, man, this is a word that hurts. Trust God, brothers and sisters. Maybe you're called to believe in a difficult time, a time that invites suffering. It's going to bring a lot of hurt to your heart and to your mind and probably to your health. And yet you're called to trust God because you love him. His ways are right and pure and holy and D, all of the above. Amen. You're going to be called to trust God even when it may cost you something. It may cost you something. What if your employer comes to you and says, hey, I need you I know that this is what happened on that day, but I need you to write the report in this way. You know, because I've got to report to someone and we just need to make sure we cover our bases here. So let's write it in this way and we'll kind of sweep that under the rug. We'll forget about it. We'll move forward. What are you going to do? When your spouse comes to you and says, hey, I know that God's word, and they won't say it just like this normally, but in essence what they're saying is, I know that God's word commands us to do this or that, but it's more expedient that we do this or that. What are you going to do? You see, it's going to cost you something to trust God, but what I'm telling you that you're never sacrificing in trusting God, you're never sacrificing the fullness of joy. You're never sacrificing. In fact, you are guaranteeing it by trusting God. By remaining devoted, by abiding in Christ at all times, in all ways, choosing to trust the Lord over man, choosing to have the praise of God rather than the praise of man, you are gaining for yourself an inheritance kept in glory for you, which is in heaven, undefiled, It's a hope that cannot be put away. There's nothing that can separate you, right? You see what I'm saying? You're building for yourself, as God is building in you, an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And so sufferings and hardships and pains and whatever it may cost you really do pale in comparison to what awaits you. And you must fix your gaze on that. Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. I'm going to joyfully obey you, even if it costs me something, even if it hurts, I'm going to obey you. Because trusting God in order to lovingly and joyfully obey him is what faith in Jesus Christ looks like. We find the fullness of joy and devotion to Jesus Christ in doing so, and so we overcome the world by the one who has overcome the world. Jesus says in John chapter 16, verses 33, as he's getting ready, Uh, to head into the garden where he will pray a high priestly prayer. He'll be arrested and then crucified. He says this, he says, I have said these things to you, which are those things he said gathered in the upper room from John 13 through John 16. He says, I've said these things to you so that in me you may have peace. So what foundation are you building on? In me you may have peace. In the world, he says, you will have tribulation, you will have trouble, you will have trials, you will have sufferings of all kinds, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. (laughs) I have overcome the world. And then in verse 5, he just asks the question, who is it that overcomes the world? Well, Christ has overcome the world, so who is it then that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Christ or Jesus is the Son of God? It's a rhetorical question. 
And the answer is no one else. It is only those who believe that will overcome the world. John personalizes here in a question the point of verse 4. He makes faith specific. The victory doesn't come by merely believing something. Our culture loves to suggest that as long as you have faith in something, this is all that matters. You can have faith in love. You can have faith in friends. You can have faith in whatever you think is true, whatever your truth is. You can have faith in yourself. And as long as you have faith, this is all that matters. But what's the problem with that? The Bible. (laughs) Very good. The Bible teaches us that the victory comes by believing someone, not just some random thing. And it's not just any someone, for the someone has been highly exalted by God, and God has bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so so that at his name, Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what Paul writes in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. But the object of our faith is the key. We must have faith in the Son of God if we are to overcome the enemy and to overcome this world. Belief in Jesus. Belief in Jesus as the Christ. Belief in Jesus as the Son of God shows that you have been born of God, and it empowers you to overcome the world through faith and obedience and love. And so I ask you today, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins, that he was raised on the third day? Do you believe that he is now seated in heaven where he exercises dominion over his creation with all power and authority given to him by the Father? Have you received God's love for you in Christ Jesus by repenting of your sins and submitting yourself to his rule? Belief. Do you believe? Do you long to obey God? Is it true of you that you love the Lord by obeying his commandments? Is that true of you? Is your heart prone to wonder? Prone to leave the God you love? Are you astray from him now? I urge you then, come back to the Lord through repentance and faith. Return to him. Obey the Lord. Do you love his people? Do you strive to have one mind and one spirit with God's people for the sake of the gospel? Do you love the brethren? Do you love to be a part of the church? Do you love to dwell among your brothers and sisters in the Lord? Or have your preferences gotten in the way? Have your preferences kept you from loving your brother or your sister? What must you do now to reconcile with God and with your brother or sister? Have they sinned against you? If you sinned against them, go to them in either case and seek reconciliation. Or is the offense just based on a preference that you might have? Well, then you must repent before the Lord and to not allow a root of bitterness to take shape in you. Love for others. Brothers and sisters, we will, we will overcome the world by faith in Jesus, obedience to God, and the love for others. So I encourage you now, let's fly to God to find mercy and grace in our time of need. We pray for you.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. I pray now that you would grant to us belief in Christ Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, the one sent to save his people from their sins. Would you help us to believe him? Would you help us to follow him? Lord, would you help us to obey you and your commandments? Help us to be like David in Psalm 119, just writing and thinking over and again about the greatness, the grandeur, the, the freedom that is found in the commandments. That by them we know life and life more abundantly. Let it be said of us that we are those kind of people who love the Lord by obeying his commandments. We take obedience seriously. And if we have wandered astray, would you lead us back now? And Lord, would you lead us in love toward one another? And where there are difficulties or strife, where there is any pain or heartache, would you help us to be reconciled to our brother and sister? Show us by your spirit what our next action must be. Help us to seek reconciliation that we might be the body of Christ, that we might be the kind of people who strive together with one mind and one spirit for the sake of the gospel. We praise you that you have acted on us in love, and so we ask now that you would empower us to love you and to love your people. I want you to take a moment to continue praying to seek the Lord you need to repent of something, name that thing now before the Lord in prayer. Ask him for his forgiveness. Be reconciled to God through faith in Jesus. If you've not yet submitted yourself to him, would you confess belief in Jesus Christ as the Lord of heaven and earth? Confess that he is the one who died for your sins. Confess that he alone saves you from the penalty of sin and gives you life. And submit yourself to him. Receive him as your Lord today. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for Christ. We thank you that you have loved us enough to send your Son to die for our sins. Help us to believe. Help us to obey. Help us to love. But these are all works that we are powerless to. As Christ has told us, the flesh is no help. Life comes by the Spirit. And so we pray that your Spirit give us life now. We ask you to give us life. We praise you for your word and the time we've had in it this morning. It's in the name of Jesus we have come to you. Amen.